Don't walk the beat if you can't stand the heat. No, don't do it. Keep your eye on the sparrow. When the going gets narrow. Don't do it. Don't do the crime if you can't do the crime. Don't do it. <laughs> you got even with me. It's a set up and you got even with me. All right. Get in here. Just one more little hunk of Beretta. You know, I was able to do practically anything I wanted to because I had the guy from ABC, Michael Eisner, on my side. And when he saw the first few days of rushes, he said, leave him alone, let him do whatever the hell he wants. Now, they had a guy who wrote the theme for Jimmy Garner's show. He was a nice guy and he was a regular musician and he was going to write something. Well, everything about Beretta was going to be different, including the music. Don't do the crime if you can't do the time. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't put your feet on a one-way street. Don't do it. Don't do it. Keep your eye sparrow when the going gets narrow don't drink my flit if you can't take my shit don't do it don't do it don't put your feet on a one-way street don't do it keep your eye on the sparrow when the going gets narrow. Couple of interesting things about that. They had the two nice writers that wrote um, uh, Rockford Files and this and that, but uh, Struther said, hey, is this their show or your show? Is this some universal, you know, put all the squares together and you got a show? Or is this the Robert Blake show? What are you doing? So I said, uh, okay, I'll figure out what I'm doing. So I threw those people out and I threw out uh, Roy Huggins, who was the original producer by accident because he had done a show called Toma. And when Toma was canceled, they were going to make me into Toma, so they gave me to uh, Roy Huggins. And we lasted about 10 minutes together, and I pulled him over the desk, and he got stuck by a, by a paper, paper with them, and these them pointed things that you put the paper on. He, he had to go get it. <laughs> he had to go get his ribs fixed. I kicked him out the door, and I said, don't come back in here, or you're going to go get worse than that. You wind up in the hospital. He didn't have any idea what I was doing. And because I didn't particularly like him, I wasn't going to tell him what I was doing. So I called a guy that did Willie Boy. His name was David Grusin. He wasn't a big deal at that time yet. He became one of the best writers of features in America. I mean, everybody wanted him. He moved to Arizona and he used to write music just in Arizona because he liked living there. But, you know, Sidney Pollack, hey, people call him 
and he wrote a lot of good music. So he wrote Willie Boy, and that was one of the best things about Willie Boy. And one day, I was on the set, and he was listening. He was going around listening. He wasn't listening to people. He was just listening. And I said, I don't want to bother you. What are you doing? He says, I'm listening to what I'm going to write about. He was listening to the desert. He was listening to the brook that was running. He was listening to the to, to the uh, birds, the, uh, the 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 road runners, the the sounds at day and night, and if you can stand to look at Willie Boy, it ain't that bad. It really isn't that bad. I just I have a bad taste in my mouth from it because I had a real tough time with the director because, like I said, he was one of the best directors in the world. He wrote Body and Soul and directed it. One of the best movies ever made in the world, and I'll argue with anybody about it, was Body and Soul. Boxing was the background, but that wasn't the story. It was the most beautiful love story. The dialogue was exquisite. And Anne Revere, who was one of my favorite actresses in the world, I have to deviate for one minute. Remind me where I am about the music. Anne Revere, I loved her. She was just one of the best actresses in the world. And she was in Body and Soul. And she was in a lot of other great movies. And she got stuck with the witch hunt the blacklist, and all that jive-ass shit that went on. Uh, so she went to New York, and she did plays, and so forth, and so forth. When she started working again, I hired her for Beretta. She played a social worker. And this is a great line. I'm showing off a little bit, but it's a great line. And I swear to God, I swear on the head of everybody. If I'm lying, may I die right on this spot. We were working together on the first episode, and it was the second day, and she was also a wonderful writer. So, uh, and I, I rewrote everything on Beretta. Every day, I, I, I just wrote, rewrote everything. Did something didn't work. The hell with it. Throw it out. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. She walked up to me between takes and she gave me a big kiss and she said, up until now, I never believed in love at first sight. I'll never forget that line. When I'm long gone, that line will still be floating through the air. It was one of the most beautiful moments I ever had and one of the most beautiful lines. Up until now, I never believed in love at first sight. Anyway, she wound up doing, you know, five or six episodes playing a social worker. So that's the Anne Revere story. And if you care anything at all, if there's one actor out there who's listening to me, remember what John Garfield said, life is a rehearsal, your performance is real. Look at Anne Revere in some of her work. The one where she played Montgomery Cliff's mother, Place in the Sun, just so many performances that were staggering, just staggering. And one of them was in Body and Soul when they bombed the speakeasy and she and her husband worked in a candy store next to it, and the bomb killed the husband. And when she walked in, she got down on her knees, and any other actress, any other actress would not have resisted the moment to just eat the scenery. And she did just the opposite. 
She did it all with her eyes and looking down at her husband and her lip quivered just a little bit. She didn't say anything. There were no tears. She just looked at him and looked at him and tore your heart out. And then she leaned over and put her hands on his chest and laid her head sideways. And that was the end of the scene. Anne Revere was one of the best there ever was. I'm not taking anything away from Charles Lawton or anybody else, but Anne Revere was it. So now we're going to go to the music. And uh, he wrote beautiful music for Willie Boy. Might have been the best thing about Willie Boy because he captured the sounds of the desert. He captured the sounds of the wilderness. He captured the sounds of the quail and and all like that. And he 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 wrote music, but he wrote the music around those sounds. So I got in touch with him and I said, I want you to do me a big favor. I know you're into features now, you're probably not doing a lot of television anymore, but please help me. I just have nothing but respect for you. You're a masterpiece. I don't know how you do it. So he came on the set while we were shooting. And once again, he did the same thing. He was listening. And I didn't ask him because I knew what he was doing. He was listening to sounds. And he picked up a tin cup. And we were working in a jail. And he put the tin cup against the bars and burr, 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 sounds like that. And uh, sounds of sirens and sounds of outside the street. The, the, uh, we were shooting a fight scene one day and I think he taped the fight scene. And, you know, he didn't put the fight in the movie, but he, 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 it was just extraordinary what he did. And he wrote a tune. And I didn't get the tune at first. Ba, ba, do, de, de, do, da, 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 da. Ba, ba, we, ba, bu, ba, 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 we, ba, ba, ba. And that was street sounds. They were all boom bop 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 You could feel the street. You could feel the east side. You could feel South Philly. You could feel New York. You could feel all those places. We never made Beretta come from one place. Of course, if we did, we'd have had to put up with her police department and all those kinds of things because... Telly Savalas' show was New York. And it was written as a two-hour movie by one of the great writers of all time. I never got a chance to work with him, but we became very, very good friends. Um, but that was New York. So he had to adhere to what the cops told him about New York. So we made it an Eastern show, period Eastern show, but we didn't give it any place because we didn't want to get in trouble. Now it came to the words. And Brucin wasn't great at words. They were not his thing. Music was his thing. And sounds, sounds of where the movie was. And sometimes there wasn't any music there were just sounds. There were just sounds. And then he'd go back to music again, or sometimes he'd put the sounds and the music together. So I called my friend, Vicki Arnold, and I called my dear, dear, dear loving friend, Sammy Davis. Sammy Davis has saved my life more than once. And those are stories I'll take to the grave with me. 
and I said, you guys got to help me make this series work. And I started working on words. Don't do the crime if you can't do the time. Don't put your feet on a one-way street. Drink my flit if you can't take my shit. Don't, and keep your eye on the sparrow. Now, I think, and I can't say for sure, but I think Grusin came up with just that word, keep your eye on the sparrow. I don't know where it came from, but I wrote most of the words and I gave Vicki Arnold uh, credit for writing the words because she helped me a lot. There's no question about that. She helped me a lot. And I went to Sam and asked him to sing the theme and throughout the series. So uh, Vicki Arnold brought three or four girls in that were good singers. Vicki was a singer and she was a piano player. She was a musician. Uh, and she brought some f girls in to do backup for Sam. And Sam sang the theme Keep your eye on the sparrow. Don't do the crime if you can't do the time. Don't put your feet on the one way street. Don't go to bed with a price on your head. Don't drink my gin if you don't believe in sin. All those words that I had heard working in jailhouses, doing jobs, uh, acting jobs in jailhouses, in cells, and uh, prisons. There's a difference between a prison and a jailhouse. Most people don't even know that. Uh, but anyway, when we went on the air, the Black Tower, Lou Wasserman, and all the people in the Black Tower, including Eisner and everybody at ABC, for the first two episodes, they cut Sam singing out because he was black. They left the music in and they left the girls in the background, but they had some white schmuck sing the tunes. And I quit. I went to the Black Tower and I went to Lou Wasserman and I said, you can call me up, you can call up SAG and have me taken out of SAG. I'll go to New York and I'll work on the stage. I'll do anything, but I'm not walking on the set of Beretta again until you promise me that if Beretta goes for one season or 10 seasons, Sammy Davis Jr. will sing that song. And you better swear it, don't lie to me. You know better than to lie to me. I'm too crazy for people to lie to me. Look what I did to the producer of Beretta. I put him in a hospital, don't, don't, he said, okay, Sammy will sing it as long as it's on the air. And it became a number one on the hit parade. He put it in his act and he sang it for a couple of years in Vegas and here and there and everywhere. And I think the two greatest performers I've ever seen in my life or ever knew were Elvis Presley and Sammy Davis. And it would be a toss up to figure what, who was the best 
entertainer. Now, I'm not talking about singer. Frank got on the stage and he sang. And that's all he did was sing. And he was great. And so was Tony Bennett. And so was a whole lot of other people. Great women singers. They just got on the stage. They stood next to the piano. And they sang. But Elvis Presley performed. And he had backup singers with him. He danced. He did all kinds of shit. And Sam outdid him because Sam was a better dancer. And he played the drums. He played instruments. He sang. He danced. He did imitations. Sam did Jimmy Cagney. You, you dirty rat. You're the guy. You're the guy. And he was great. He was sensational. And it would be hard put to say which one was the best entertainer America ever produced because they were both great. Remember I told you Humphrey Bogart and the Dead End Kids, Leo Gorsi, all of them were on Broadway and they were all actors. And Leslie Howard saw Humphrey Bogart one night playing tennis anyone, playing one of those silly parts that he played. And Leslie Howard was getting ready to do Petrified Forest on Broadway. And he said, Humphrey Bogart is going to play Duke Mantee. And everybody said, that's impossible. He's a guy with a tennis racket and he talks with an English accent. And Leslie Howard said, if I do the play, he's going to play Duke Mantee. And that's all there is to it. So get yourself another actor. So he made, he invented Humphrey Bogart because Humphrey Bogart played a bad guy in it. Played a bad guy. And he was brilliant in it. And it was a big success in New York. So now Hollywood hired Leslie Howard to come out and do the movie. And they started casting the movie and Leslie Howard said, wait a minute, we're gonna tear up my contract. Well, they said, why, what did we do wrong? Humphrey Bogart has gotta play Duke Van T or I'm not making the movie. They said, you're crazy. He plays Duke Van T or I'm not making the movie. And that was it. And he made Humphrey Bogart a star because Humphrey Bogart went under contract to Warner Brothers and played probably two or three dozen bad guys before he got into the Casablanca era. That's just a little side note about sometimes talent recognizes talent better than producers or directors or studio executives or anybody. Talent can smell talent. And Leslie Howard just said, that guy has just been playing the wrong roles, that's all. He belongs, and that was it. And then he did Dead End, and he did about a lot of, a lot of movies. Um, I want to tell you one other thing. Oh yeah, it's the first time I ever believed in love at first sight. When I did Beretta, this was after In Cold Blood, when Struther, Struther told me that you're Perry Smith and you have to justify every word, every gesture, everything, it all has to come out of you. And uh, 
I even brought the guitar to do the screen test. Uh, and I sort of did the same thing with Beretta. It was a, it wasn't me, but just like Cold Blood wasn't me either, except I made it me by reading the material and building it around me. So when I did Beretta, all of the writing, all of the music, all of everything centered around Beretta. I even used the guitar and I used to go out and sit on the uh, fire escape and sing songs. Lenny Bruce was a friend of mine and uh, he in his show on stage, he would do this gay guy. Not disrespectful. He did it really beautifully. And he called him Kiki. And uh, I called him and I said, can I have it? And he said, with my blessings. So one of the disguises that I did was Kiki. And Kiki's theme song was, Strangers in the night, exchanging glances, wondering in the night, what were the chances? And I had to, <laughs> I had the wardrobe man build me some, some suits and boots and fancy hats and so he would come in in disguise. Like if he had to go in and find out something about something, he would go into the bar as Kiki and he would hit on guys. He would walk up to guys and just start, take his hat off and say, strangers in the night, strangers in glasses. And uh, in the meantime, he was trying to find out information. So Kiki, Kiki came from uh, from from Lenny Bruce. Uh, I called a lot of people, like Sammy and Vicky. I called a lot of people. I called in a lot of uh, a lot of markers, a lot of friendships, just to do do stuff for me to to make it work. And The real reason I did it was because I needed money. I needed money. I hadn't made any money on any of those movies. And when the guy from ABC said, I want him on the air, I was holding the cards. So I hit him for some dough. Now 25 grand an episode is peanuts compared to today. People make a half a million dollars an episode. But 25 grand an episode got me out of debt, got my house paid for, bought me a new car, and bought me a whole bunch of things. And that's why I did Beretta. Normally, people don't do that. They use television to become movie stars, and they remain movie stars for a long time. And then when they're not movie stars anymore, they go back to television like Peter Falk did, and still make a lot of money because they're, they're, they were movie stars. But uh, I didn't really do that. I went and did Beretta because I saw 25 grand a pop and I saw 13 episodes. So at the minimum, I was going to make a couple of hundred grand and get out of trouble. And so that was the story of uh, Beretta. I had a lot of... Um, had a lot of fun doing it uh, because I could do anything I wanted. Nobody was going to tell me anything. Nobody told me anything. If I, I, I look at the script 
and they saw four or five pages. I said, this is bullshit. Cut it down to one page. Just take the pages out. I learned that from Humphrey Bogart when I was doing uh, Sierra Madre. I looked in his dressing room one day and he had his script and he would look at the script and he would look in the mirror and he would say the line and he looked back at the script again and then I saw him going like that and when he came out he went to John Houston he says I don't have to say any of this give this to Tim Holt and give this to the old guy because I don't have to say anything let me just stand there I'll sit there and I'll talk a little bit and I'll uh, and I'll you know I'll react but I don't have to say any of these things and uh, so that that's where I got that from I said that you know dialogue doesn't make the performance because that's what some people that's that's what John Garfield said he said you know the performance is in here the performance can come with no dialogue at all the performance comes from in here up until now I never believed in love at first sight and those words I don't know where the words keep your eye on the sparrow came from but I do I do think they came from Bruce and I don't know why but I think it, he came up with that he must have heard it on the set maybe he heard somebody say it on the set because he was on the set a lot listening to sounds and downtown at night he was on the set listening to the street sounds and so forth anyway I jabber enough if I think of something else we'll come back and I'll tell you and in the meantime what can I leave you with don't do the crime if you can't do the time